Good morning, everyone, and welcome. TME presents Reconciling Air Force Real Property Records. You've read the article, and now learn the rest of the story. I'm Daniel Wheatley, Associate Editor for the Military Engineer, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Uh, but before we get started, though, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to best participate in today's event. All attendees are in a listen-only mode for the presentation, but you can use the public chat pane to chat with other attendees. Let's try that now by typing in where we are all listening from today. For me, I'm coming to you from a rainy Northern Virginia area. <laughs> um, you can also submit questions from the uh, for the presenters at any time by using the questions pane of the control panel. Uh, we will collect these questions and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, please also submit any technical issues you may be encountering here as well. And uh, we've got people listening from all over the place. I see a couple other Virginia people, Maryland people, Florida, Germany, wow, all sorts of people listening. And well, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. A little background um, on this before we get started here. Originally featured in the September-October 2020 issue of TME, Reconciling Air Force Real Property Records, detailed how an analysis and reconciliation of GIS data with real property asset records at Hurlburt Field uncovered millions of dollars in underfunding. Uh, to get a deeper look at how that process, and many like it, will yield benefits for the US Air Force, uh, this webinar uh, will examine the role and impact of the Air Force GeoBase program. GeoBase integrates enterprise geospatial data to support everything from installation asset management to emergency response to bio and environmental needs. Uh, the program consistently reconciles data and provides related training to support each installation and the Air Force as a whole. Uh, I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Uh, Scott Onsen is the U.S. Air Force Geobase Program Manager, Air Force Civil Engineer Service Geospatial Integration Officer. Uh, joining him is Vince Sclafani, Vice President and Geobase Contract Support Director with Wolpert, and David Street, Senior Technical Contract Support Lead for the U.S. Air Force, also with Wolpert. Uh, Scott, Vince, David, uh, you now have the digital floor, so take it away. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Scott Ensign, and uh, we would like to thank uh, Sammy and TME for inviting us to and making this possible for our, uh, and our moderator, Daniel. Thank you. And all those taking time out of your busy schedule today to join us. Next slide, please. Go ahead, go to the next one. Today, our team will go behind, as Daniel stated, behind the scenes of the September-October 2020 TME uh, article, Reconciling Air Force uh, Real Property, uh, that highlights the effective use of location-based data to improve distribution of facilities, sustainment, restoration, modernization, or many of us know as F FSRM funding. Next slide, please. This outlines the major focal points of today's presentation. If there is anything that you can take away from this is that we would like you to understand that uh, engineering better decisions, much like constructing physical structures, begins with sound a sound foundation. For those operating in the digital space, location is a very much a very large part of that foundation. Next slide, please. So this year, uh, very quickly, uh, Michael uh, Daniel gave a quick uh, overview of it, but this is the Air Force's geospace program celebrating its 20th anniversary. So we've been around quite a while, but the, the use of GINS or geospatial information and services started much earlier within the Air Force as individual installations adopted uh, uh, GIS technologies and capabilities to support their environmental and mapping of the installations. 
Uh, Geo-based program was established in 2001 to improve enterprise exploitation of built and natural infrastructure, reduce duplication of data collection, uh, such as imagery and other efforts that were being done many times over at each installation. Today, the Air Force uh, uh, geo-based program is the primary manifestation of geospatial engineering uh, across in support of combat supported efforts. At its core, the geo-based program is the intersection of physical and digital domains, but it is not an, an IT uh, program. It's it, it, the work, the people who do this work, geospatial professionals, geospatial engineers, assist airmen to describe their operating environment by employing geospatial engineering techniques, procedures, capabilities to create, maintain, integrate, analyze, and share authoritative geospatial data, high resolu resolution imagery, and web-based mapping solutions across the Air Force. Today, Mr. Vince Scalfani and Mr. David Street will walk you through an example or several examples and discuss related topics impacting effective and efficient use of geospatial capabilities in the Air Force. I think it's off to you, Vince. Thank you. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, uh, next slide, please, Daniel. Good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon, since we got everybody in uh, Germany also. Um, so we just to go into a little bit about the article. So the reason we're all here is because of this article and the great work that they did at Holbert Field. Um, but basically, as you can see from the slide, um, the base civil engineer basically felt like something was not right about his FRS funding and basically got the geo-based analysts and the real property officer to uh, together to have them actually kind of look at the records and do some reconciliation. Um, and, and do do some data investigation. And it, immediately once they started doing that, which sounds very simple and something that should be, always be done, but as a lot of people know who will work out there that sometimes it's not difficult because everyone's busy doing their jobs and getting the mission done. Um, but they've found a bunch of discrepancies. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, a lot of them were very simple errors, but it wound up costing and, and, and doing a lot of money as far as a million dollars. Uh, one example was um, one of the transformers was a 15 kilovolt transformer, but when the data got changed or something happened in the data along the, all its different steps, it got changed to be a 15 volt transformer. So you can see just in that one example, that's a 1,000 times off uh, error that would result in 1,000 times less money possibly or however it linearly worked. So with all those different anomalies that they found, uh, they, it, it basically was a million dollars. Some of the also things that they helped help by finding this all together by putting the, the map data and the real property data together was just things that were missing. So as you can see from the, uh, the slide, you know, 17 were actually there, but they actually had 390 and a bunch of pumping stations were found. So uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, the way this was working is is that by merging the geospatial data and with the real property data, that there were situations where the, the geospatial data was actually there, but the real property data was not there. And so they could do that by showing that on the, mo the map and the dot that represented the, the pump or the transformer would show up as red because it's an orphan data. And so it's very easily seen. And then they could get together and, and, re and fix the real property data. In other cases, uh, the real property or the geospatial data didn't have it, but the, the uh, geo-based collected orthorectified imagery had it on the image. So you could physically see that there was something there, but they didn't have either record. And in that case, then um, civil engineers got together and they went out there and they GPSed it, and then they re recorded the information and they entered it into both of the systems. Uh, so then when they re-ran the numbers, of course, this, this if fully funded would turn out to be a two point to $7 million additional funding, which is always a great thing. Um, so uh, next slide, Daniel, please. Um, so, so of course, this, you know, it's a great story and it's a great windfall for, for Hoover Field. And that's why we are all here once again, but just to go on to expound on it a little bit more, um, it, it, it just, it, 
it fixes the, the, the issues where a lot of times some of this funding happens because everybody is busy again, once again, is that instead of, instead of if we do this consistently throughout the Air Force or throughout DOD even, um, instead of doing, hey, this is what we got last year or, or this is what we think you should have, it would, it would actually make sure that you would get this funding based on the data so that it would be repeatable and it would be actionable to where there was no argument on how much money you should have gotten because it would be based on the data. And then once again, if it happens at the installation level, then it is a micro approach. So the installation is saying, hey, our data is correct. Uh, please give us our correct funding. But then what happens is, of course, all the data is uh, merged in together, then makes the data better for, for uh, the level at AFCAC for audits such as, as the FIAR. And so this, this is a win-win for, for everybody. Um, in addition, of course, let's be realistic, you know, if we were to do all of this, then of course, uh, you know, all installations would hope they would get more money, but then some, we would find out that there would be anomalies where some installations would get more money or getting too much money with some installations were not getting enough money like Culver Field. And then they would all probably equal out. And then maybe in the end, it would be less money total in funding, but at least it would be based on the data. And that's kind of the goal and the point of, whole, of, of what we want to talk about today. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Daniel, please. So just to kind of go into some of the other systems and, and, and kind of set this up for, for Mr. David Street, um, just as a very basic data flow for civil engineering, uh, most people on this slide, uh, on this call know this, but we just wanted to show that it's a very complicated and, and long process, uh, like Scott was mentioning, to, to go through uh, from an idea to executing to actually uh, finishing off any kind of mission or any kind of facility that, that, that we need in civil engineering to support the Air Force mission. Uh, and as you can see is on those, those life cycle bullets, I mean, it's multiple steps. Uh, and the problem with that is that a lot of times as these, as it's all different groups and different entities and they're busy, that a lot of times the data isn't shared throughout these different steps and which happens uh, where the data, uh, where we get to these reconciliation problems. So we feel that, that the, if we were to share data at every single step along this process, then this geo enablement or this reconciliation would actually happen naturally. And that's kind of the point that we wanted to show. And you can go to the next slide, please. So here are some, finally to get into some examples and, and Dave will go into uh, more details of it, but just to kind of highlight a little bit on them. Um, so we wanted to say that, you know, we, this has been being done, of course, throughout the entire program. Um, anybody that was anybody that was uh, involved with BRAC in 2005 and got all those questions that you had to answer at every installation, you knew that you, you, you had to reconcile and, and, and integrate your geospatial data, your real property data, your environmental data, because of the questions that you had to answer and you had to make sure they were accurate. And so this is just a great example of what we had to do to, to, to meet that, that tasker when it came ac uh, uh, across our, our desk at, way back when. So this is something that we know that we need to do and always do, but we just need to talk about it a little bit more and maybe raise attention to it. Uh, in addition, like we're, where we were talking earlier, this thing also complies with FIR. And so everybody who's been through the FIR audit knows it's very um, you know, convoluted and, and we have to always produce all these records so that the auditors can see all the different real property entities. Um, the first round of that, there were some notice of findings and the notice of findings basically said that the map data and the real property data didn't match. And so um, some of the things that Dave's gonna show is that because of that, we have now been motivated and we've gotten you know those offices together and we were actually merging and reconciling this data and so the good news about that is of course the data is getting better but the the, the even better news is that um, for the installation levels the data is getting better even at the macro level and filtering down to the micro level which then everybody's data gets fixed because then the micro uh, the installations are the owners of the data and they will fix it because we can identify them, identify the anomalies and help them with that. Um, in addition, 
you know, we're, we're also working with sustainment management systems with the Corps of Engineers, where we can do things that are just very simple, you know, just to imagine if we just had a map, and that's something that Dave's going to show, that showed the condition index, and then integrate it with with um, how much funding you're putting into a in, into a facility and the, the mission dependency index. And so you might find things that would just show up bright red on a map that shows that uh, the condition of this facility is very poor and it's not very important to the mission, but we're spending a ton of money on it because its condition is poor. So it might easily give you a, a much easier way to say, you know, that that's our demo list now. Um, and uh, I think uh, that's about it right now. Uh, so Dave, what I'd like, uh, if you could, if we you hand this off to you and then let you go into more detail about the uh, yeah. applications. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Vince. And this uh, and and right here is a couple of really good examples. Uh, I, I know they're they're kind of small images of some of the dashboards that we've we've been building, but it's still the same premise. Uh, these are in this case these are more of a the macro level you know views. And <clears throat> so the 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 top image there is a dashboard of a. A joint effort that we worked with uh, out of Tyndall, uh, Mr. York Thorpe uh, worked with his team, and the goal was for us to take all their linear segmentation data and um, capture that information and also put it into our GIS system, um, which in the future is going to help prep for all the SMS uh, efforts, you know, leveraging all the SMS uh, efforts in the future. And this was just a good way for us to go through and validate that, hey, the data is being loaded at the installation level, uh, which is that, that micro level. So um, by, you know, tracking that, making sure that all the attribution is correct, and, and also putting uh, that uh, information at the base level, we also gave control to the installation. So they worked with the probably the sub amp manager, the GIS person, you know, the in local engineer to make sure that the, uh, that the data was being loaded properly, that it was accurate, that um, the information they got, if not, it gave them the ability to respond to it and, you know, provide feedback uh, back up to Tyndall and, you know, and all the engineers there. Um, and, uh, you know, then the next uh, example there is the, BIPLE, which is, I think, the integrated planning list. Uh, but essentially, that is all the utility. This particular one is for all the utilities. Uh, these are all the plans that are, are currently in place, which uh, feeds uh, to all the different utilities along with uh, location and then all the cost for each of those utilities. And in this case, you could, in the example there, we were zoomed out to all the extents, and you could see you know, how much uh, all the different plans and all the utilities. And there's there's a lot of details. I don't know if you can see on the screen there, but there's lots of tabs. That, and, you know, as you zoom into a particular installation or you pick a match comm, you know, in the Air Force, uh, you, you could, you know, aggregate that data up to that level. Uh, you know, Vince brought up a couple of good things there, good, really good points. Um, you know, first off, the, the micro level, our, our data is driven at the installation level. So they're the ones out there capturing all the information. Uh, so like what Matt did for the article, you know, he identified just that very simple, you know, attribute field, which uh, changed, uh, you know, the cost drastically. Uh, they're the ones that really are the ones capturing that information. It's moving from system to system or office to office. In some cases, it's paper trail. Um, and, you know, and they're loading it at the installation. Uh, and how GeoBase works, just to give you an example, that, that information gets fed up to a larger enterprise data warehouse, essentially. So, uh, and there's different ways it gets there. Some of it's automatic, some, uh, you know, gets received and loaded. But, and that's where we get this, you know, more of a larger, you know, rolled up view that you can see in these uh, dashboards here. Uh, so those are two good examples of, you know, supporting uh, the items there on the left, you know, I2S, SMS, FSRM uh, with different dashboards. And, 
Also to give you a sense of the amount of information that we have, uh, so the installations, they work with about, uh, the GIO shop works with about 550 layers or tables, or you can call it feature class depending on your terminology, but essentially about 550 of those. We have about 30 million records. Uh, if you're looking at the number of vertices, we're close to a billion. I know it's over 900 million different vertices, you know, different geometries, line, points, lines, and polygons. Uh, that we work with. So there's a, a large amount of data, but still, you know, we, I'll go, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. I'll, uh, uh, and in this case here, this is the, both of these, uh, this is the real property reconciliation effort. We have to pull in data from other organizations such as real property, or we may pull it in from different systems such as builder and I'll, I'll talk through an example about that later. Uh, or it could come from, uh, you know, our, the AMP manager at, uh, for utilities. They may provide or provide data for us that, you know, we also have to compare against. So we have multiple sources of data that we have to pull into ours. Uh, fortunately, most of that is, you know, you have to pull it in by a spreadsheet and load it and, and, and work with it in that manner. Uh, it's not through a service or a, uh, some cases it is, but uh, it's not necessarily through a service or say a REST API that we could pull it into the dashboard and work with. Uh, but here's another example of how we are doing our real property audits. Uh, as you can see here, we have, uh, you know, we're identifying different anomalies. You know, we've got different data, we have standards, uh, we are integrating real property with our geospatial data. We're doing analysis or visualization. Uh, and by that visualization, if, you know, we're not necessarily, well, we kind of are there in that first, that bottom one where we're, we're zoomed in very tight. Uh, you can see that there's uh, different buildings. We have different structures. Um, and in this case, uh, we're doing some discovery. Uh, you can see that that is an unreconciled structure. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in this slide, but that particular structure has a, you know, it's outlined by a dark, by a dark uh, outline. That way, if you're at the at the installation level, uh, you can sit there and see it and go, oh, okay, real property. We have a real property record. This one doesn't have one at all listed, and that gives the individual, the GIO, or whomever on the team to go out there and figure it out, you know, work with the real property office and and figure out what that structure is. Is it still there even? Because uh, it could just be the image, you know, we don't have a, maybe we don't have a geometry for it and we have to create one. Or we have one, we have a geometry for it, uh, but it hasn't been capitalized in the real property record. And that's the, uh, so that bottom tool there is is that that's what that's for. Uh, the top tool is really kind of the, a similar type effort, except you could get into more detail about the attribution. So you could go down into an insta you know, you could click on a facility, for instance, and and see all the information about it. You could also uh, uh, do do some other, you know, management. Uh, you know, this this is, uh, for instance. Not, it's a privatized, you know, housing area. It's not on our real property record, and uh, even though we're counting it against it, so uh, it gives the the local GIO and the real property office the ability to work with those different assets, and uh, you know, and like Vince mentioned, you know, with this fire audit, and make the you know corrective actions, you know, to the to the record, and hopefully you can do an immediate action, you know, uh, where we can just get it done, uh, fix it, but also uh, as the real property office and say the GIO office are working together on FIRE, you know, they come up with more of a, a long-term solution, you know, what is the what is the correct uh, process to get this done, you know, and, and like that's where Scott steps in and, uh, you know, he's for the for the GIO, you know, and says, hey, this is the process that we currently follow. Uh, real property, you know, he works with the real property office and up at, here at AFCAC, and, and they work together on coming up with a solution to make sure that when 
real property has got a real property ID and our, you know, the base level folks have to go through a pretty difficult process of taking those as built and getting them into GIS that we're capturing all the information that it's accurate and it, it's fully reconciled and capitalized. <clears throat> So uh, those are a couple of the tools uh, that uh, we use for our real property efforts right now. Uh, and there is some great benefits to the, having the really accurate data. Uh, if you'd like to go to the next slide, please. So uh, I think probably most of us remember when uh, Hurricane Michael hit Tyndall Air Force Base. Uh, and Scott, you can, you can always uh, uh, jump in here if you if you want to mention anything. But uh, as soon as it hit, uh, you know, Scott, he he asked if we'd be able to get a, any imagery, and we were fortunate enough to be able to maneuver and, and get a plane down there and fly over it pretty much within the first couple of days. Uh, what that allowed us to do, uh, part of the geo-based program, we capture imagery about every three years of all Air Force installations. And so we already had the, the pre-imagery pre of the installation of Tyndall. Um, and having the team go down there and flying directly after, uh, the idea was that we would take that imagery and then take the information, say, from builder, uh, from real property, and uh, take that information and put it into a tool that would allow us essentially to go in and, and evaluate. We brought in engineers into our office, uh, I think after the weekend was over. So the, it was a, I don't, everybody probably doesn't remember, but that was like a holiday weekend. It was like a four day weekend and people left work and didn't go back for quite some time. Uh, so we brought engineers into our shop, uh, structural engineers for instance, and we went through uh, every single facility, uh, took the existing uh, mission index, you know, what was the importance of the mission associated with that facility, what is the importance, you know, of what was the building condition prior to that, and and then how much did that building cost. Uh, and so we took that information to generate a, uh, you know, kind of a, a prioritization to help, you know, uh, Tyndall, you know, figure out, hey, what do we have to do as far as recovery, and then uh, future support. So, uh, uh, you know, and Scott, I know you know a lot about it. Yeah. Uh, that so, yeah. So, like to to it. Yeah. So, some of the things that we did. So, we actually were preparing for it probably about 48 hours before it occurred, trying to gather assets, finding out could we fly over it. Um, um, and we're informed that, and this Tendo was already scheduled to be flown that year. So, it was not a change in modification to even the contract, it was just a change in timing. And uh, fortunate enough, uh, our contract support aircraft were actually at uh, Pensacola, so ready to go. Uh, but we also dug into um, other, looking for other data sources even um, after after it hit, uh, the hurricane went, went over Tyndall. Uh, one of those sources was that, as everybody, uh, the Digital Globe are now owned by Maxar um, uh, imagery that is you know, acquired through NGA. Um, we were in contact with them regularly trying to get the imagery, but they, with cloud, every time a satellite went over, it was cloud cover, cloud cover, cloud cover. So, and there were several other uh, instances of, uh, of others that uh, tried to fly it, but where the resolution wasn't there to be able to view it. Uh, we captured imagery, uh, a video uh, taking from actually, uh, in many cases, it was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, breaking some laws, not us, but they did. Uh, helicopters and drones, people, you know, around the area just flew over the base and we were finding those on YouTube and, and, and scrutinizing those with once our imagery was collected, be able to truly get a view of what those were. We also dug into other data sources uh, that were uh, uh, contained both within systems and outside of the systems to identify hot spots, you know, has, hazardous uh, storage locations, uh, hazardous, you know, hazmat pharmacies and things of that nature, so that the individuals on the ground would not would be able to identify where where's the danger points at that could go beyond. Uh, what would be expected. Uh, and we did work with engineers along the way, uh, really spotting those out and really, truly identify where those issues could be, both uh, structurally, 
uh, was a facility worth saving until uh, individuals get on the ground and do much more of a, a, a very close estimate and identification of the issues on the ground. Um, and it, it proved to be very effective. Yep, and uh, thanks, Scott. You know, we, we do have uh, a video to show uh, to kind of walk through the tool just as an example. But again, it's a, it's a great example of how uh, this kind of data, this information can help drive decisions, you know, especially when it comes to cost of facilities, you know, the, or any, any, whether it was a structure or facility or whatever was impacted. Uh, during Hurricane Michael. So uh, I guess we can go ahead and show that now if you'd like to go to the next slide. I don't know if it's in the video or there we go. And I'll just talk through the, the steps here. <clears throat> so this is pre and post imagery. As you can tell, we're just zooming in and going to look at the, the, the different facilities we've got you know, imagery here that we've also loaded, just as Scott said, you know, we had some imagery that we captured from news feeds, uh, whether it's video or images uh, that you could load in there. That was to help, uh, you know, assess early on. Um, we did a, a pre and post imagery, so they could dive in and, and really look at what the facility looked like before. Uh, pretty drastic, and you can see stuff completely missing. We have some selector tools uh, that we can zoom into an area. Again, oh, I'll let the video catch up here. So here's where we're doing a cost estimate to recover that particular area that's that's on the screen. So he'll go ahead and do a selection. And again, this is just based off of uh, multiple sources. We do have quite a bit of uh, the information already captured in Geobase. But so it shows the different facilities and the estimated cost uh, to repair that based on, you know, our work with our, our engineers that we had during that time. So we're going to go through and do an, uh, another assessment, and this is just to show the different levels of damage in that particular area. So as you can tell, you know, we had broke it up into three categories, moderate, severe, and uh, destroyed, and that was really to give a percentage of what you know how it's been recovered, what has to be recovered. And, uh, I believe that's uh, I believe that's the video. So, so I'd like to point out, if I may, you know, we, we none of this could have been done yeah, without yeah, having accurate real property records, you know, and the relationship of having that accurate data available before the action occurs. I mean, the last thing you want to be doing is chasing all this down, you know, in the middle of a crisis. So, you know, having this data available for a day-to-day -day purpose also works in the crisis mode and, and making that where you're actually concentrating on the a recovery or the crisis itself, uh, the emergency um, and you have all that data already supplied uh, versus digging for it. When in this case, we had to dig for some of this data uh, to make it available, uh, go out and do research and, and talk with uh, individuals who might maintain it or offices and be able to pull it in, Excel spreadsheets and things of that nature, where if, if we're working on identifying these requirements and, make, and, and having the, the best accurate da uh, data available uh, within the resources, um, it, it, it does. It just works out when it comes down to these crisis moments much better. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, uh, you, you know, Scott. Saying, I, you know, uh, yeah, I was just going to add on to that, Scott. I mean, so I mean, basically, if 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 every one of these data sources had some sort of data sharing API by default, 
then this would just naturally happen. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I, that that's what we all hope for, which is either some sort of service available that or some sort of uh, REST API that you could call and uh, pull data as, as needed uh, to share that data, which gives the results that Scott just described. And, right. um, yep. And, yeah, this was, uh, like Scott said, we did have to uh, really put out a lot of, you know, effort just to get the data and get it loaded and then obviously build the the tool to, to represent the, the data spatially and, and show all those capabilities. But, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of what you just said, Scott, definitely parlays into this next slide. I, um, I don't know if you wanted to continue to talk to the talk to that um, or if you want Vince was this up to you on no, no, I, no that's all right um, so this you know, got, okay yeah thanks yeah yeah this, this shows who benefits from um, having accurate data or geospatial data from our perspective but it really comes to overall data uh, it serves so much of the of the different communities um, and many times the um, um, we in the past and, and, the, and the barriers are breaking down, but in the past, and in some cases still today, that uh, many of the functions who maintain some kind of data really see it as, hey, I maintain it. I'm really the only group that really needs it. And it, and it will actually be very supportive of many efforts and make much more informed decisions and a very and shorten those times. And that's a key thing, shorten those decisions times uh, uh, down to uh, a fraction of what many are, are what it takes today, and that's already been proven across many capabilities. Uh, bring in geospatial data has shortened, in some cases, the decisions to be months uh, for uh, new bed downs and things of that to 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 weeks, and in some cases even to days or hours, depending on what the situation was. So you can see all these different uh, who benefits from better data, from geo, better geospatial data, the integration of geospatial data. Uh, into into your uh, daily use, um, so that that really brings out the uh, importance of programs across all the services because every service has a program similar to the geo based program. Uh, uh, the Navy's geo readiness, uh, Marines geo fidelis, Army uh, Army IGINS, and then other agencies within the DoD also have similar smaller agencies have several capabilities, and we work quite often together on developing standards and, and, and sharing capabilities across the board. So uh, this serves, even the data across services is shared uh, to some capacity to be able to do that, but the greater sharing of data will create that uh, greater, uh, uh, better, uh, uh, not better decisions, but it will drive a better, more informed decision. Next slide. So in our, in our sense, <clears throat> the Air Force Geo-based program, excuse me, uh, really supports across the spectrum. That's one thing about the, uh, the Air Force is that, uh, and many of the other services, they have uh, completely civilianized um, the installation maintenance workforce, uh, you know, support workforce, and, and rely on their military to basically be a war fighting only capability where the Air Force still does both. Uh, our, our civil engineers and the, and the geo-based uh, program and the geospatial capabilities fall within the civil engineer uh, portfolio and, and is worked out of the civil engineer squadrons and groups at the installations are doing both. They deploy to do this work, and but they also do it every day. And so it is very much a, a cross-functional, cross-spectrum support capability, uh, supporting those, uh, uh, you know, the geospatial engineering activities as per, uh, you know, the joint doctrine. And you can see on both sides of that, everywhere from uh, the day-to-day -day, um, installation support uh, to combat support uh, to, to, to emergency services, disaster preparedness, and then also into expeditionary operations, as I stated. But it's the same group of people doing that in the Air Force across all those spectrums. 
Next. Next slide, please. So that really comes down to uh, where we're at. We're, we're open to questions. Uh, like I said, I'd like to thank you for all participating, being here today to join us with this and really would like to uh, answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, David, for uh, the presentation. Um, and I just want to remind all of the attendees that um, if you've got uh, questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A tab there on your chat pane. Um, I know we've got a couple uh, in there already. Um, we're going to get to as many as time allows, um, but feel free to um, put them in there for anything that you've got. Uh, so I just wanted to start um, with, this is a question for uh, really uh, everybody here. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, geospatial data integration, I think that, um, you know, it's got, there's a lot of uh, potential benefits here, obviously, that you've touched on today. Um, so what do you think is the best way to make geospatial data integration occur throughout the Air Force and DOD? Well, I, I think it's 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 happening now uh, across the DOD. You know, we're working with, uh, as I stated before, our other services. Um, um, some may be on the line, you know, on now uh, to to come up with standards. Uh, that's one of the key things in interoperability. I mean, we could use any system. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the the software package we use or uh, particular companies. But if the data is, you know, come, we have standards of. Uh, uh, standards of the da database and how we store that data and the kind of data that we use, it can really, um, it makes it interoperable now. Now we can use it with everybody. And one of the things that needs to occur though, is that those other systems outside the traditional geospatial, uh, you know, network that, that we're part of, um, you know, command and control systems, um, asset management systems, uh, logistics systems out there, if they want to have a geospatial capability, is to really design their systems around that portion of it, be able to ingest that geospatial data, to create those maps, to show relationships based off location, have to really bring in that standard and use that standard across the board. Otherwise, there's a lot of back, back, background work or duplication of data collection, which is really what the geobase program was founded on, to reduce that duplication, to almost to try to eliminate that duplication of efforts and be able to make it available across um, the Air Force and across the DOD as necessary for uh, you know peacetime or wartime operations. I think so. Yeah, Dave, uh, Vince, anything you want to add on? No, I'm good. Sounds pretty good. No, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> Yes, I don't know. Scott, Scott, I think you've got everything. All right. Um, so here's a question here from uh, David Foster. Um, also wanted to say uh, he mentioned uh, a real quick shout out uh, to the uh, SME Geospatial Working Group under the Facility Management Community of Interest uh, for SME members who are uh, listening in or interested in uh, joining this uh, for geospatial engineering topics. Um, there's a link that he's put in the chat there for you to check it out and join. Um, thank you so much, David. Um, appreciate that. Um, so his question is, uh, who has access to the Air Force Geobase managed built in natural infrastructure ge geospatial data? Well, the, the access is dependent on need, need, need basis, um, you know, it, it, it is available as far as viewing and stuff through uh, the AFGEMS, the Air Force Geospatial Integration Management System, uh, and, 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 and then a couple other MAGCOM specific systems uh, across the Air Force. Um, it, but for operations, you know, it, it's, it can be, uh, I believe we have an API. I'm, I'm, I don't know if we had to turn that off or not, you know, Vince or, uh, uh, on the IT, on the technical side of that nature, I think they could probably Vince and David come into that. But it, it can be made available to almost anybody. But it's 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 you know need to know, need to have purpose. We have to vet that and, and so on. 
Yes, Scott. This is um, yes, Scott. The, we do. We still have that API, and so that that API um, basically will allow you a essentially a URL access to this information. And so this is kind of what we we're talking about for all the other systems of record. Um, so you know, we we the the the, the geobase program could provide anyone who wanted access to be able to link their data to the map. We could basically give them a, a, a parameterized URL, which would allow them to to integrate this map pretty easily. You know, so it doesn't need to be any kind of formalized process or anything. I mean, of course, they need to ask Scott for permission to do it, but uh, but the, but it's 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 very easy once those APIs do exist. Um, and because uh, we support joint bases, um, it, it is uh, .mil enabled. Um, so if you have a, a valid CAC and certificate and uh, you're on a .mil domain, um, you do have the potential to get to this. Great, thanks, Vince. Um, so another question is sort of about some of the uh, te technical aspects here um, from Chris Clouch. I hope I'm pronouncing your, uh, your last name correctly there. Uh, apologies if I'm not. Um, does the facility SF data from Builder update the master real property records? Is there a synchronization or process to use the most current accurate data to update the master real property records? I'm, I'm reading it over again. I'm sorry. It's, it's silence. So when, when it comes to the builder, I mean, I, I've got a, uh, I'm not sure the exact process of what they're doing with the uh, back and forth between it. I know there was a early on, there's an exchange of information to try to update it. But as far as from the geospatial process, they are reconciling that uh, across um, uh, the Air Force is being worked uh, continuously and worked right now uh, to update the real property records uh, based off findings of what is in the geospatial data to see if they reflect each other, that reconciliation, um, to, to ensure that the most accurate and that, you know, basically what was done at, um, at uh, Hover Field uh, by Matthew and, and, and the team there is being is being spread across the Air Force, so that that is being done on a daily basis now. Right now, um, repeating myself, and to get that uh, all the records up to date, we're focusing on right now in the three areas of of buildings, structures, and uh, uh, and linear structures. And linear structures is utilities and 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 pavements to ensure that it is reflected both in the geospatial data correctly and the real property data accurately. And those two matching each other kind of would meet does meet the fire requirements, but we want that accuracy beyond fire. You know, as we stated, it comes back to resourcing, uh, and it's coming back to it later on is what we go through right now is we're also looking at a manpower study here coming out, uh, and 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 that affects, um, and the specific one being engineering flight, but this will affect manpower studies across the board for civil engineers and possibly others. Is that all? Almost all of those are based off of how much you have. You know, how much infrastructure do I have based off dollar amount or based off actual, you know, square footage, square yards or, or linear uh, feet of um, of utility systems will drive manpower also. So those accuracies go well beyond just the FSRM, but it goes into other areas also. All right, great. Thank you so much, Scott, there. Um, so here's a question here from uh, Daniel Elroy um, asking about how GeoBase links uh, GIS to the document management systems. Uh, any, any light you can shed on that? Oh, I think it's a Vince and uh, <laughs> Dave, Dave answer that one. Yeah, um, we, we, if you're talking about maybe SharePoint um, or, or something like that, um, there are some some links that we can do with that. But we uh, we've had mixed success with that. Um, 
we do have an internal document management system that that we we utilize um, because some of some of the information we do keep is about uh, like uh, uh, 103s, which are the, the work clearance forms, and some of the A13s. Uh, so we. The answer is yes, we can link to some some document management systems. We do have some internal ones just to get our mission done. Um, but right now it's not too widespread. Um, Dave, do you have more information about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, we kind of like what Vince described. We, we do have a, you know, it's called GMR, which is geospatial metadata I don't know, management repository or something on those lines, which allows us to really load just about any type of document into the system. Uh, but what it, the only real way we have connected to other systems, say a document, is through putting the link in there um, and dropping a point. So if you have a facility, say a facility, and we're going back through and you want to link the 1354 to it, uh, if there is a, a link to that on a, on a SharePoint site, as an example, uh, we've done tools like that, but it's, it's not uh, super widespread. It, uh, it's just a way to, you know, pull different products in uh, that may be associated with a building or uh, as we've done some, the, the A team, which is the, the runway folks uh, going out and evaluating the runways, uh, we, they have a lot of documentation associated with that effort that we have uh, added to it, but it is something that's more of a, a load type function. It's not pulling from a, a separate system. Uh, the capabilities there, uh, if, again, if it goes back to there's a, a REST API or there's a service that that particular system is putting out, then we could actually tie to it, especially if it had some sort of location, whether it's a building, an address, an installation, or even if you had some sort of X, Y values with it, uh, we could we could plot it on a map. So that's about the, it's something we do, but it's uh, not, uh, you know, uh, super heavy use. All right, great. Thanks, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Vince, for uh, taking that one. Um, so uh, Nancy Coulter here asked um, how widespread is the use of GIS uh, to reconcile real property records in the Air Force? Uh, do you know which bases use it? Um, I think, you know, we hope all of them would be, but uh, I don't know if you have an up-to-date uh, number or uh, anything else you can share about um, how the adoption is uh, coming along for it. So, so yes, it, it's actually mandatory now across the Air Force. So every installation is doing it right now. Um, and coming up with the better process of how to do that in the future. Uh, but the current effort is really to meet fire requirements. But it's like I said before, it's going to have a trickle effect uh, across many aspects uh, from funding to manpower, uh, you know, staffing to to, uh, you know, decision making. It, it really is, you know, we have a we have a congressional mandate, but at the same time, it's really serving so much more across the Air Force. Hope that answered the question in the previous discussion also. Oh, great, thanks, Scott. Um, and uh, here's a question from uh, Zig uh, Rezviziak. Uh, apologies if I'm mispronouncing anybody's last names here. Um, uh, and uh, yes, can anyone speak uh, to how the verification process was structured uh, when actually visiting locations in the field to confirm attributes for reconciliation? So it, I, I can say it's, it's very, very different from, not very different. It can be different from installation to installation. Um, in some cases, it is the geospatial professional being, you know, engineer being sent out to, to do some verification data collection. But a lot of cases also to bring along that uh, expert from the shop, you know, the, the electrician, uh, you know, the, 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 the plumber and, and so on to help verify those things because the geospatial professional may not be, in a lot of cases, not the expert in the different fields. So they've got to have others in there to be part of that process. Um, and, and, and as they go through that, 
uh, building those relationships with those other offices, those shops to uh, do to uh, verify that data. You know, the hope is in the future, as many cities and, and metropolitan areas do, is that the data collection in a lot of cases is done by those those very highly skilled technicians and professionals on their specific thing uh, at the edge, you know, at, you know, their, their specific area of what they work on and bringing that back either, you know, wirelessly or bring them back to the uh, 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 to the office and hook them back up and putting that data in on what they're specifically the experts for and, and then go through reconciliation process after it's been put into the system to verify its, uh, its accuracy. So, it, it, you know, there's still evolving uh, ways to bring that and, and do that work. And, and there'll be many different ways of doing that work continuously, depending on your, your resources. And Scott, if you don't mind, I'll, uh, I was going to mention one thing. Yeah, we did provide uh, essentially story maps down to the to the auditors that went to each installation. Um, you know, and those are items that we continue to improve. Uh, one interesting part about that is that since uh, the Air Force, Army, Navy, we all are running off the same standard. Um, say the Army is going through fire inspections as well. Uh, we could. We could even provide those MXDs, for instance, and they would work at the at the Army side just as well, um, with maybe some minor tweaks. But uh, uh, what they show is all the building structures and linear structures and real property, any real property information that's associated with it. So as they're driving around the installation, uh, they can see what they need to see at that time. Well, All right, great. Thanks, Dave. Um, and I think we've got time for about one more question in here. Um, and something I always like to ask is, uh, what are what are the challenges? Uh, what are what's what's stopping um, you know the adoption of, of this you know from you know across Air Force, across services, and DoD? Uh, what are the challenges that you're seeing um, in the future? Well, I think there's a few challenges. One is the the knowledge of this capability. Um, it is still, uh, even though the geo-based programs existed for 20 years, and and you know individuals may have heard the word geo-based. What does it really mean? Well, it doesn't mean the capabilities of 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago. It's not the same as capabilities today, and the data that can be provided. I think some of it's cultural, to um, to, to really, it's not just geospatial data, but all data is how important the data is and that everyone is a data keeper, data producer, and, you know, and, 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 and provide that back into a larger um, knowledge base to support the larger effort. Um, there's one thing about, um, you, you've got to get, we very much concentrate on the installations from our office because we can get the installations right, we can help them through the process. We can provide them templates. We can provide them uh, processes that help them. They don't have to think about it. They can just go out there and do the work to supporting their mission at their installation. We get them right, we get the Air Force right. And so that's where we put a lot of our effort into, though we still support the you know, larger effort on specific things, you know, uh, you know, higher headquarters and, and our, our, our leadership, you know, they ask questions, ask us to do things. They ask us to provide analysis. We do that. But we really couldn't do that without the installations doing their work. You guys got anything to add to that? Um, yeah, just, and tell me if I get too sensitive, Scott. But you know, you know, as far as the technical issues, um, you know, you know, as you know, I mean, cybersecurity and information assurance is is very strong uh, throughout DoD and the Air Force. And so we, we run into a lot of roadblocks and challenges because of information assurance. You know, so a lot of times, you know, the, the, the data sharing is completely possible and everyone wants to do it, but um, we have to go through the, the, the proper approvals and paperwork of information assurance. And sometimes it's almost uh, a little cumbersome or, or overwhelming. And so that's a lot of times people just, you know, give up and, and and don't make these sharing mechanisms 
So, you know, it, it may at some time we need to evaluate and calculate the risk to determine if uh, there, are, there are some risks that we can take to share data and, and make this a better product, uh, you know, to support the mission. Uh, so that's also a, a challenge right now. Over. All right, thanks, Vince. Uh, anything else, uh, Scott, uh, Dave, that you'd like to add on to that? Uh, I think we're I think, nice closing remarks uh, since we are just about at noon. Uh, no, I'd just like to thank no, once thank again you. for the, the, the time and, and inviting us to do this. We're, we're happy to share as much as we can. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Scott. And thank you, Vince and Dave, and, uh, uh, for taking the time out of your schedules to present on this and giving us a uh, deeper look behind uh, the article. Uh, so, uh, and thank you to all of our attendees as well for um, attending the webinar and listening in and for all of your questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so before uh, you head out, make sure to grab your PDH certificate. Um, and a copy of the slide deck from the handout uh, tab there in your chat pane. Um, you'll also uh, be receiving a link to uh, the PDF certificate um, later on in about like a, an hour or so in case you miss it here. Um, so for those of you who are interested in submitting an article to the military engineer, uh, you can visit our website for our editorial calendar and guidelines. Uh, proposals are currently open for our July issue uh, July-August issue, um, which is going to feature a special report on next generation technology. Uh, so if you are working in the geospatial data field or uh, you have a you know, article uh, topic that you want to write about um, related to geospatial data or geospatial integration, um, I, we would love to uh, review it. Uh, so on behalf of SAME, uh, the military engineer and our featured presenters, uh, thank you for joining us today, um, and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Daniel.